allows the soul to be certain if it's actually hearing the voice of God. Welcome to Elsa Groy listeners. I'd like to welcome back my four listeners and a dog. Today we're diving back into St. Teresa of Avila, the interior castle, six mansions, chapter three, part D. We're picking up where we left off last week on interior castle. There was so much information that St. Teresa had to share with us, so much good information in her spiritual direction on hearing from God. And we're going to pick up again this week where we left off on part two. Let's roll this stuff. We got here today, Mike. Glad you guys asked. So again, we're diving back into six mansions. What is the six mansions, Mike? Teresa devotes 11 chapters to the six mansions. Right now, we're only in chapter three. By far the longest and most developed section in the entire treatise of her books. In them, she examines a prayer of spiritual betrothal. Where are we right now in the six mansions? Remember, we're walking a prayer map right now. St. Teresa has, has put out this beautiful, wonderful map of her interior life on where the stops are as we develop deeper and deeper our spiritual life and relationship with Jesus Christ. In the sixth mansion, she calls it spiritual betrothal. Back in the fifth mansion, remember, Jesus promised himself to us. And now as we're in spiritual betrothal and the spiritual engagement, he's going deeper. He's showing us more incredible stuff in the heavenly realms. And he's showing us who he is, but he's also cleaning us up in more sanctification and more trials. Yep, remember trials comes hand in hand. Trials and humility. That's one thing you want to walk away with St. Teresa of Avila. What's one thing you know about her? Trials and humility. It's not about the supernatural experiences. It's about God developing it from glory to glory here. So in them, she examines this, the prayer of uh, spiritual betrothal, the mystical state that flows directly from the prayer of union. Remember, it was uh, back in, uh, I guess, the fifth mansions. The stage of the soul's inner journey has a lot to do with rarefied mystical experiences, such as locutions, we're hearing, hearing spiritual voices, visions, we're given visions into the imagination, intellect, and raptures, where our soul is literally picked up, or we can be physically picked up. And we'll get into that. I believe raptures occurs in uh, Six Mansions Chapter 4. We're not there yet. We're still getting through the locutions and hearing God right now. So again, this quote's from Dennis Billy, Interior Castle, the classic text with spiritual commentary. I highly recommend picking up that book if you can go through this material. Very good stuff there. My, my book's tattered. I actually had to purchase a copy on Kindle. My wife is going, don't you already own this book? And I go, there's so many notes in that book, and it's so tattered in the cover right now. I read it so much that <laughs> I had to have a digital copy just so I could refer to the ones that didn't have notes all over it and I could read it. Uh, good times, good stuff here. So again, in the fifth mansions, we experience a vision of Jesus who promises himself to the soul. St. Teresa's analogy of spiritual engagement, right? This whole thing is about, this is where we get the term relationship and we avoid the steps involved in the, the, the current American church. You know, so we're in a relationship with God. What does that look like? That's what she outlines, the interior life. They call it the interior life, the relationship of God, and how deep you go with him. And I, you know, like I said, I, I taught a class recently and people were questioning, well, Mike, why are you teaching some of this Catholic stuff? And I go, well, I said, let's not throw out the baby at the bathwater. Who was St. Teresa of Avila? She was a woman who absolutely loved Jesus, and I have no doubt she's in heaven. I have no doubt. And, of course, there's some Catholic things along here along the way, and we have our differences. It's no big deal. But I said we're not throwing out the baby at the bathwater because this woman knew how to pray, and she heavily documented it. And it's, I know other people, too, and, um, and in the Lutheran circles, Protestant circles, they still read this stuff. It's not, you know, we can't get too snobby in this end times church because a lot of times the church doesn't know how to pray. We're in churches now, especially out in California, corporate churches that are run by narcissists that just want to lead the people and what they want to teach you. And it's just, it's, I don't know the way to explain it. It's, it's just bad. They're not teaching them to pray. So when trauma occurs or trials occur or bad things occur or suffering occurs, the church doesn't know how to deal with it because people weren't taught how to encounter God for themselves. And that's kind of what I'm all about here too. How do you encounter God for yourself? How do you deepen relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for, Mike. That's right. Get an amen back there. In the six mansions, you have this peace that Jesus has promised to give himself to you, the betrothal, right? You're engaged to him. We're spiritually engaged. 
There were many harsh trials in the six mansions. Yes, we do. He's cleaning this up. Jesus prepares a heart and soul for deeper union in preparation for spiritual marriage. Jesus wakes up the faculties. What that sets our mind, right? The imagination, the intellect, and the emotions. Where in the fifth mansions, they were asleep. So how does he wake up the intellect while they're asleep? Remember, we have the, the prayer of quiet. We're kind of just still, and we're, we're feeling God with him for momentarily, and then it's gone, right? And so the, the faculties are kind of like asleep there. Here, he wakes them up. So we may be stilling ourselves in prayer or something, and all of a sudden, we start to hear God talking. And he's waking up the faculty. He's going, wait, the intellect, you know, he first he has to come to the imagination, right? That's what she calls it. Essentially, the imagination is what I call our, our video production department in the brain, where we have communications, we can receive satellite images, that sort of thing. That's our imagination. That's what she's referring to. Not like we're fabricating it. However, in the human being, the problem with the imagination is it also has a job of fabricating images. We have to be careful of this, very careful of it. So when Jesus wakes up the soul, he's going to talk to the imagination. He's going to wake it up, and he's going to send images, pictures. And we have to discern whether it was from the soul or from him. And that's what we pick up here in part D of Curia Castles, Six Mansions, chapter 3. So again, I talked about the fourth water. Remember, we talked about this in the Prayer of Life. There are four stages of prayer, and she calls them water. And she initially outlined these in the, her book of life where instead of there was seven mansions, she had four stages of prayer. So if we're integrating the fourth stage of prayer here from the Book of Life, it's the fourth water, where it's described as rain. Remember when you're first um, learning to pray, you're at the um, hand pump, you know, ascetical prayer, moving the hand pump to pump the water out of the ground, and you're doing it by hand, and it's all in your own effort. And as it becomes more mystical in prayer, now in the six mansions on, we're in the fourth waters where it just rains on us, where God starts talking to us. He shows up. We're not using the hand pump anymore. This is mystical prayer. God comes to us. Cool stuff. So we're in six mansions, chapter three, part two. And we're talking about locutions. I still had more to it. I think we covered chapters, excuse me. We covered chapter three of the six mansions, paragraphs one through 13. We're doing 14 through like 27, I believe here, or 14 through 24. We'll see. Number eludes me, but it's 20 something, 14 through 20 something. So we'll find out. Just, just hang in there. So, again, locutions is a Latin word means to speak when God speaks to us. We more refer to this now as hearing God or hearing voices or hearing spirits. And those are the three categories to it, is banged out. So, locutions, I want you to immediately do the math in your head. This is hearing God. The soul can be awakened in the sixth mansion through hearing God speak. Again, these things can happen out of order, too. You're not, this is not a checkbox. I'm in the first mansion's check, second mansion's check, third mansion's check. When God lit the fire under my butt when I was in the pew, the frozen chosen, I was probably in the third mansion's. And he had me hearing God. He had me getting visions and stuff. And these were six mansion experiences. They can happen out of order, but they soon coalesce themselves in the proper order, if that makes sense. So God may give you experiences early on. It's out of order. It doesn't mean like if I was in the third mansions, doesn't mean I was jumped to the six mansions. I was having six mansion experiences in third mansions, but they weren't often until he started bringing me up to speed, if that makes sense. So these things can happen out of order. You know, I had an intellectual vision, which is a six mansion experience of Jesus Christ in a church when I was in fifth grade elementary school, right? So these things can happen out of order. They can. So just don't think it's a checkbox. It's not how it works. It's it's kind of like a uh, probability graph. You see these probabilities of this, these, um, a majority of these little probability dots in one area. If you're falling in the probability of large dots of being in the fourth mansions, then that's probably where you're at. So it's not like, I need this, this, this. Oh, I missed that one. And that's not how it works. Like if there's a, things are happening often and they, they feel similar to fourth mansion experiences, you're in the fourth mansion. And like I said, she says, you only realize it after you enter it. Cool, cool stuff. I love this stuff. This stuff excites me. This is this is where it's at. And why do we need this? Because I found out as a counselor, when I'm working with people, you know, I always get that phone call. Help, help my my husband is is demonically possessed. I'm like, oh my gosh, send him in. You know, let's let's hear what's going on. And immediately, I don't go into casting out demons mode. I go into spiritual director mode first. They must prove to me they have a demon. 
And where do I go? Let's discern what sort of voices they're hearing. What's going on? Is it something that's going on from the soul? They're having some mental wellness issues or they're going through some depression or what she calls melancholy, right? You know, is the soul telling them stuff and just rattling them? Or is it God talking to them and not discerning properly? Or is it they hearing spirits? You know, our job in spiritual warfare, first and foremost, is to discern the spirits and what's talking. That's why Six Mansions Chapter 3 is so important. Because we're on the other side of the fence now, discerning what the heck is this person listening to. I have people coming to me for counseling because their prophetic ministry is not going the way they want to. And you know, you sit and listen to them like, well, where are you at then? You know, are you getting ahead of yourself by giving yourself this office and those other things? And that's not where Jesus wants you yet. Jesus is still developing you. All sorts of stuff. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's just <laughs> you know, and we're not discerning and we're not correcting or doing spiritual direction when people hear stuff now. I have a crazy cleansing stream story. I always beat up on them, but you know, I was involved with them a lot. So I you saw the best and you saw the worst with people. So when I was in a church, this one young gal, she was probably in her early 20s, this pastor was walking around and she was giving word for everybody. This girl's great. She hears from God and all this stuff. She's got a word for you. And so she comes up to my wife and I, and this is like seven o'clock in the morning. I have to get early for prayer and get ready for, this is a retreat, right? We're about to ready to do battle and kick out spirits and stuff on the front line. And the girl walks to me and goes, you weren't well versed in the word today. God says you're not ready. And I'm looking at her like, Ooh. What? Of course not well versed in their word. I had to get up at five in the morning to drive out here, you know, <laughs> and read the Bible. But I was there going, what kind of word is that? She's giving to prayer warriors. And she looks at my wife and she's going, You're needed at home right now. Your middle son's about to do something horrible. And you both don't belong here. And I'm looking at my wife, my wife's looking at me, and the pastor going, Isn't she incredible in what she's doing? And I'm going, Oh my God, this this is demonic. This is so way off base, you know. And the pastor had no clue of what was spiritual direction or what. <laughs> it's like, you know, we were well enough along. My, my wife and I had in a prophetic mystery going, this chicks us, base case. So we didn't call home. We didn't let it affect us any. Of course, nothing she said transpired. Therefore, it was false prophecy. and It was demonic to interfere with the spiritual battle. But you'll see stuff like that. And the church will totally embrace it. And you're just going, this is cuckoo. <laughs> this isn't right. Oh my gosh, I digress. Anyhow, where was Mike? Oh, let's dive back into um, Six Mansions, Chapter 3, Part 2. So, I get, well, this is, I didn't cite Rabbit Trail too badly because we're talking about how you discern if the voice is from God. So, we're back into Chapter 14. Let's dive in. It's joy at seeing God's word verified. I know not why the soul attaches such importance to these communications, but being verified, I think that the person herself were detected in telling falsehoods, she would not be so grieved as the locutions proving untrue, as if she could do anything in the matter beyond repeating what has been said to her. A certain person was frequently reminded in such a case of the prophet Jonas when he found Nineveh was not to be destroyed. Good stuff here. So the soul just gets lifted up more when the word we hear from God, it may not have transpired right away, but does come through. It's verified. And we may have, like we said, we have took a lot of hits and beatings from it. Other people going, no, that doesn't sound right. That's not true. And you just have this certitude, like the word she used, that, oh, this is true. This is true. You know, and it was like, she reminds us of Jonah who was sitting there waiting for Nineveh and wasn't destroyed. He goes, I'm not going to destroy it. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, they should be. And I feel like sometimes in street ministry in San Francisco, are you going to destroy this place? This is too much stuff going on. So what's the verse he's referring to with Jonah? Jonah um, 4, verse 1. And Jonah was afflicted with great affliction and was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I beseech you, Lord, was this not my word when I was still in my land? You know, so he's having an argument with God back and forth. And that happens a lot of times, too. When you're talking with Jesus and you're getting words that may or may not agree with you. A lot of times I found that to be confirmation. Like, we don't argue with ourselves. When you're in a discussion and it's like a debate or argument back and forth with God, like, no, you're, you're having a conversation with God right there, and, and usually we're doing the stupid stuff, you know, conflicting with his His will for us. Kind of like what Jonah did. Jonah's a classic example. She she nailed it. So again, St. Teresa operated humility and one locution she received to be verified by God. Right? So that young lady that's coming to us telling us, oh, our son's going to be uh, sick or ill, my wife had to go home, or I didn't prepare today, you know, 
that wasn't operating humility, and none of that was verified. None of that stuff she said transpired. So it wasn't from God. It was soulish, right? I actually think it was demonic because we're a spiritual warfare meeting ready to cast out demons. And that pastor was walking around, oh, 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 look at this, you know, and they were just propagating the word of demons. Uh, you know, it was crazy. So um, we as humans do this a lot. God will send me a sign or a word, right? And it's like, and the next thing I go, uh, did I hear you correctly? Can you send me another sign? Can you get verification? It's okay. It's testing the spirit. You can ask God for verification. Don't go off the deep end. Oh my God, it's from God. Now, what am I do? You know, am I in trouble if I question it was from him? No, question it. Test the spirit. He may resend it. He may reformat it. Okay, maybe you didn't hear me correctly. Let's reformat the message in here. Exact same thing, but different wording. Or have somebody else come up and tell you that in the afternoon, hey, you know, I was just hearing God about this. Like, what? I was just having a conversation with God about this this morning. So he'll come in sideways in different ways. So don't worry. So sometimes God will verify his locutions and sometimes he won't. Remember, he's God. He's the king of the kingdom. You don't walk up to a king and ask him a question and expect him to answer. He may or may not. It's protocol, right? You're talking to the king. It's not he's aloof. Maybe sometimes the answer we're asking for may displace us or do harm to us so he won't answer us. Or sometimes he has plans for, I'm not going to answer it right now because I have a plans later on down the road as I develop you more in this walk. How I want to properly answer the question is just going to take time. See, we live in a bubble of space and time where it's linear and we have to wait for time to transpire. I don't think it's... A lot of time transpires with God in his heavenly realms. It's out of time. And that's something we human beings, spiritual beings, don't understand on the worldly side of this. Paragraph 15. It's zeal for God's honor. In fact, as these words come from the Spirit of God, it is right thus to trust them and to desire that he who is supreme truth should not be thought a deceiver. Justly, therefore, does this hearer rejoice when after a thousand delays and enormous difficulties they are accomplished. There's roadblocks and delays, and we talked about that. It may not be answered right away. Although the success may entail great suffering on herself, she prefers it to the non-fulfillment of what she knows our Lord most certainly foretold. Possibly everyone is not so weak as this. If it indeed is weakness, though, I cannot myself condemn it as an evil. <laughs> So let's unpack here. You'll become confident in the words that come from the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Supreme Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit will not deceive you, right? In the book of John, it is the Spirit of Truth. So you'll have this confidence that it came from, from God. How do we know? Because usually it's to edify and lift you up. It's not negative. The only time you may hear something negative will you get this feeling from God where he's saying, I don't want you to go to that event. I get those. You know, I just had to... Confer with a friend just recently. I was supposed to go to one event last year. And my way of going to dark events for ministry is that God will send me. Nothing ever transpired from God to send me to that event. So I didn't go. And so the person's going, are you going this year? I go, yeah, if God will send me. I'm totally open to going. But I don't go where God doesn't send me, especially when it deals with spiritual warfare. So the person goes, what kind of answer was that? And I go, yeah, I'm going if God sends me. That's my answer. A lot of times these individuals like I work with go, well, just put it on a credit card and just pray that God pays it off. And I go, that's not the way I work. It's like me and Jesus are cash and carry, <laughs> right? So if God wants me somewhere, he literally sends me somewhere. I don't pray, you know, like tell people, hey, I'm raising money. I don't do that. It's just like if he wants me somewhere. The money transpires or manifests and he sends me there. And I go, okay, that's between me and him. That's our system. That's how we work. And that's how I know I'm supposed to be somewhere like Especially somewhere dark, like, dang it, you're paying my way there, and I didn't even mention it to anybody. Okay, I guess I'm going. So it's the spirit of truth. He told me if you're going or not, right? So he interacts with us, and be confident in the words he tells us. If he tells you, you know, he may tell you no in the spirit, like, no, you're not going. That's just confident the words came from the Holy Spirit. You know, he'll tell us no. He disciplines us. He's not going to tell you you're an idiot. That comes from a demonic, right? So it's like, you fool, you idiot, that's demonic. Jesus will go, you know what? You know, we're having hard times here. We're going through a trial, we know, but um, this trial is here to correct what we're dealing with right now. And we'll get through this. And that's how Jesus speaks. Locutions coining from the fancy. <laughs> fancy. I guess he's referring to the imagination. If these locutions proceed from the imagination, they show no such signs bringing neither conviction, peace, nor interior joy with them, 
but in some cases I've come across on account of a very weak constitution, or vivid imagination, or of other causes I do not know. Persons will be absorbed in the prayer of quiet and in the spiritual slumber are so correctly carried out of themselves by their deep state of recollection as to be unconscious of anything external. All their senses thus being dormant as if asleep, as indeed, at times they really are, they thus in some sort of dream fancy they are spoken to or seeing things they imagine come from God, but which leave no more effect than dreams. Hmm, interesting. So what's going on there? So we can imagine stuff and create stuff. You know, the human brain, especially our imagination, if we see something, we're designed to be creators like God, right? We're imaged in the, uh, in the image of God himself, but we're lower than, than angels, right? But we still have the ability to create like him. We're, we're, we procreate here on earth through reproduction, and we also create through art, through building, through engineering. So if our brain sees something, it's more than capable of going, you know what? I can fabricate a Jesus <laughs> visitation dream or a Jesus prophetic dream just as well as Jesus can. Let me show you. And it'll, it'll just do it on its own. And we have to be careful to discern it. What happens is the elation and the edification and whatever else mysteriously came in with the Jesus seal dream is not there with the dream we fabricated the dream of fancy, as she calls it. The dream of fancy. <laughs> so knock off those dream of fancies or discern it. You know, talk with somebody about this. I don't think this is a spiritual dream. Do you think this is? Like, no, doesn't sound like it. But you'll get the feeling when they are and when they're not. After you get these quite a while, the hardest part people struggle with is when they know they're actually having those dreams or even if they're having them. And most likely you are. I ask people, oh, I don't dream. It's like, no, sometimes you go in such a deep state of sleep sometimes. God speaks to us in that, that, that slumber. You know, Job... Sometimes speak to one people one way and sometimes another through their dreams. And that's in um, the book of Job. He speaks to us that way. We just don't catch it. Imaginary answers given to prayer. Again, one who very lovingly asks something of our Lord may fancy that an answer comes from him. This often occurs by think that no one accustomed to receive the divine communications can be deceived on this point by the imagination. That's what he's talked about here, right? Where where um, the brain can make stuff up. But if you're receiving quite some time now, I could tell the difference when it's a fabrication from the imagination. It just, it just does it. Or if it came from God, the feelings are different from them. And they don't even look the same sometimes now. It's like even, so God would go, you know what? The imagination is going to do this. I'm going to create a deeper <laughs> content or deeper contrast, better brightness, better coloring, or whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's going to feel different and look different. Paragraph 18, a confessor should be consulted about locutions. I believe this is true. Especially if you're learning, you need to talk with somebody who's better up and make sure you don't get that girl that pastor is walking around. You don't want her for your <laughs> interpreting locutions. So paragraph 18, a confessor should be consulted about locutions. The devil's deceptions are more dangerous, but if the foregoing signs are present, we may feel fairly confident that these locutions are from God, though not so certain but that if they refer to some weightly matter in which we are called upon to act or if they concern a third person. Hmm. We should consult some confessor who is both learned and a servant of God before attempting or thinking of acting on them, although we may have heard them repeated several times and are convinced of the truth of their divine origin. His majesty wishes us to take this course. It is not disobedience to his command, for he has bidden us hold our confessor as he representative, even where there is no doubt that the communications come from him. Thus we shall gain courage if the matter is a very difficult one. I think it would be very dangerous to act against our confessor's advice and to prefer our own opinions in such a matter. Therefore, sisters, I admonish you in the name of our Lord, never do anything of the sort. What is she talking about here? You receive something of the th for a third person or for another person. So what she's saying, I received either a word to give to somebody else, whether good or bad, or usually um, if it's good, you know, I just go ahead and del deliver it. It's uplifting. As long as I didn't put a mantle in the person, like God's, you know, I heard something, you may be having a rough week or something this week, and, and God says, don't worry about it. You're going to have a great week. You know, go ahead and deliver that one. But God says, I see what you're doing behind closed doors, you know. 
like, you know, you mean you're a Jezebel spirit or something like that. You know, you need to have deliverance from that. You know, that's no, no, no. That's not how God delivers it. You go talk to a confessor, or excuse me, we don't have. Well, if you're in a Catholic church, talk to your confessor. But ask ask somebody in spiritual direction that's that's higher up. Like, hey, you know, how we address this thing because. It's delicate, and you don't know if you heard from God correctly. You don't know if they're actually dealing with something, witchcraft or something like that. You just don't know. You don't know. And so talk to somebody, how do you hash it out, or how do you approach somebody, you know? And th- there's ways of doing it, but just don't go and deliver it. Like I said, you've heard me harp on this show. If you listen to this long enough, you heard me harp on how many prophetic ministers in ritual abuse survivor ministry have derailed work of others because they had bad prophetic messages that were shouldn't be given in the first place because they were negative, right? And it got derailed. And had these people, you know, came to talk to me as a counselor or something like that, hey, do you think I should give this to this person? You know, I said, no, I don't think so because they're not ready for that plate right now on time. And they didn't sound like something they're they're doing right now, so I wouldn't. Because the soul fabricated it based on um, you know, it's like being judgmental, right? Either being judgmental. Or Satan will help me fabricate somebody just to cause um, anguish in the church. And if you have a, a Jezebel spirit prophet, which I was guessing was that one prophet we had to deal with in <laughs> back in cleansing streams, you know, it's a false prophecy. It's 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 dark. Then, you know, you're going to have to deal with it. So let the people higher up a deal with it and point it out. But I wouldn't deliver any harsh news. Because that's a prophetic no-no right now. Don't deliver harsh news, especially if you're learning. Speak with other people about it. And you don't know what sort of mental state or mental wellness state these people are in when you deliver it. And it could spiral them for weeks or into something horrible. So be careful when you deliver a word for another person. Hash it out first or work it out with somebody that's experienced in delivering prophetic words or hearing from God about other people. That's what she's talking about here. It could go bad. She says, therefore, sisters, I admonish you in the name of our Lord, never do anything of the sort, right? It can go, it can spiral really fast. And then they'll be able to listen to you again, like, oh, she always gives bad words, right? Like, yeah. So our Lord will reassure our confessor whom, when he so chooses, he will inspire with the faith that these locutions are from the Holy Ghost. If not, we are freed from all the obligations in the matter. So again, when you talk to your spiritual director and they go, that doesn't sound like Jesus or the Holy Ghost. Um don't deliver it, then you are freed from the obligation of delivering it anyway. It's like, no. And don't feel bad if you heard something wrong like this. It's okay. You're learning to hear from God. And you do the right thing by consulting other people who are higher up about, was this from God or not? Because they'll steer you and help you into learning to hear from God. Like I always say, you're allowed to fall off your bike. And this is those occasions, especially when you're hearing from God. Hearing from God's fallible, even from the best people. My God, you know, he's beat up on the the, the pink hair lady and the, the Moses guy, the, the, the false prophets out there. They're big. And I'm surprised how many Christians haven't caught that these guys are false because they don't use any sort of discernment or test the spirit to listen to. And nothing ever said transpired. But it sounds so good and heavenly in the words they've weaved. And that's the deception in itself. So that's not what prophetic ministry is. There are no capital P prophets anymore like Elijah and like, you know, and we're trying to build that thing up again. It's not, it's dead. You know, John the Baptist was the last prophet. I believe prophetically he was decapitated. That means the capital P prophets were cut off at the head. And now we're in the Joel 2 um, dispensation, let's say, of the church, where the Holy Spirit was pulled out on all mankind. And we're little P prophets where we perceive we don't receive, we perceive what we're hearing, and that's what makes it fallible. But the Holy Spirit communicates that way. That's the way he wants it, and that's the way he does it. And so as we learn to work with him in a relationship, we hear him better. So we're perceiving stuff, and we need to hash it out with a spiritual director. I wouldn't consider spiritual moms or dads spiritual directors unless they really have walked in this, and they've done lots of stuff that prove themselves. And I mean by outside their church and outside their community. Okay, very careful. So when you receive a word from another person, test the Spirit and consult the Holy Spirit for authenticity, as she's saying here. Spend time in prayer of locution before sharing what you heard and discern it with others. 
Paragraph 19. Interior Locutions. God speaks the soul in another way by a certain intellectual vision, which I think undoubtedly proceeds from him. It will be described later on. It takes place far within the innermost depths of the soul, which appears to hear distinctly in a most mysterious manner, with its spiritual hearing, the words spoken to it by our Lord himself. The way in which the Spirit perceives these words, there's a word again, right? The way in which Spirit perceives these words and the results produced by them convince us that they cannot in any way come from the devil. Their powerful after effects force us to admit this and plainly show they did not spring from the imagination. Careful consideration will assure us that of this following reasons. Okay, so she talked about an intellectual vision. That's when you feel the presence of God and it's full on. Like I feel, I feel God here. I'm feeling, I'm standing, you know, it's almost like the Moses incident. You feel like you're standing before the burning bush, right? Um, there, there's something there. There's something supernatural. It's, there's no fear. It's just, my gosh, I'm in the presence of something, you know, something royal, something, something kingdomly, something big. It's Jesus. I'm in the presence. You don't see, or he, see him. You don't hear from him. It's the whole body and spirit and soul are engaged in his presence before you that you don't see. That is an intellectual vision she's talking about. Paragraph 20. First sign of genuine interior locutions. Firstly, the clearness of the language varies in the different kinds of locutions. Those that are divine are so distinct that the hearer remembers. If they were a syllable missing and what words were made use of even though a whole sentence was spoken... But if the speech were only a freak of fancy, it would not only be audible, nor would the words be so distinct, but only be half articulated. Second sign, paragraph 21. The second reason is that often the person was not thinking of what is heard. Sometimes the cushion comes even unexpectedly during conversation, though at times it refers to some thought that passed quickly through the mind or to a subject it was before engaged. Frequently, it concerns things of whose existence the hearer knew nothing, nor even imagined such events could ever come to pass. Therefore, it is impossible for imagination to have framed such speeches and deceived the mind by fancies about what it had never wished, nor sought for, nor even thought about. Okay, so in this sign, it drops in automatically. You need to read Mike Verkler's book. He covers this extensively. Um, Four keys to hearing God, but this is one of the things you learn right uh, early on when you're learning, like especially from the, the art of hearing God from jo John Paul Jackson. I took that course. the The thought drops in right away. In other words, you may be thinking, "Oh, hey, I, I'm reading this book, and it's maybe a book on Western or something, like some Western thing with some cowboys riding around and stuff." All of a sudden, this thought drops in, like, you know, something profound. Like, I need to go read. John chapter one or something. It just drops in all of a sudden, like, where'd that come from? Or I need to go tell my neighbor, um, you know, something's wrong or something's going on. I just feel it. You know, is everything okay over here? I just felt I should come over. It, it drops in suddenly. It's like, it's like instantaneous. It's very subtle. You know, it's probably not the best examples or you get a picture. It drops in like you're reading your book and also you get this picture of something that drops in your mind. Like, where'd that come from? And just acknowledge it right now. Oh, God's giving me a picture of something. God, you know, who's this for? You know, it may come in over time. It's it's not just something that just the imagination just spits out. Like I said, the imagination will spit out. This is something that just drops in. It starts manifesting and starts taking shape. And it's different from our thoughts, but it's subtle, if that makes sense. So you weren't thinking about it, but suddenly it comes in. I'll need to highlight this and talk about this more. Like I said, we probably need to do a thing on hearing God after this. <laughs> Just bring up speed, but that's the most important key. It just drops in suddenly. Again, there's more information on Mike Verkler videos and Mike Verkler's um, book, Four Keys Hearing God. I suggest go check those out. But I'll, I'll bring some stuff material up to this too. So paragraph 22, third sign. The third reason is that in a genuine case, a soul seems to listen to the words where areas when the imagination is at work, little by little it composes what the person wishes to hear. I'm praying to go on an outreach. It's dark, you know, but like, oh my gosh, it's going to be dealing with witchcraft and all this stuff might be exciting and stuff like that. And I'm very excited. And Jesus, like, I feel Jesus wants me to go, you know, and the soul's like, yeah, we should go to this. 
And then by Saturday, you're feeling, hmm, I'm just hearing I'm not supposed to go at all. You know, why, why did I feel that? Because the imagination jumped in and answered. So be careful. We got to test the spirit. We have to discern. Like I'm saying, things take time to hash out with God. You hear something from God? It sounds, you know, it sounds redundant, you know. Go ask God. God, did I hear this from you? And get the con- That's how conversation gets going. He likes talking to us. I think he does that for conversation. You know, that's how he, you know, gets us talking to him. Fourth sign, paragraph 23. The fourth reason is because divine locutions differ immensely from others. A single word comprising a depth of meaning which our understanding could not thus quickly condense into one phrase. She used to call this dark knowing, or maybe that was John, um, John the Cross called it dark knowing, where a single word can come in, right? I'm receiving a word and you unpack it and there's far more deeper meaning than when you just got that first word. And it's, it's, it's called a dark knowing or it quickly condenses into a phrase. So God may have um, compressed his transmission and, and, and it decompresses and expands and you got something. Fifth sign, paragraph 24. Fifthly, because in manner I cannot explain these communications without any further explanation frequently give us to understand far more than is implied by the words themselves. I shall speak farther on this on the way of understanding hidden things, which is very subtle and a favor for which we should thank God. Some people are exceedingly suspicious about these and other communications of the same kind. I speak particularly of someone who experienced them herself, i.e. her, (laughs) St. Teresa. She always does that. Let's return. Though there may be others who cannot understand them. I know that she has been considered a subject very carefully. God having often bestowed this grace on her, her principal difficulty was to discover whether locutions were merely fancied from the imagination, made them up. Let's continue. It is easier to know when they come from the devil, although being so wily, he can with facility imitate the spirit of light. Right? Beware of that. That's why we don't go consulting or talking to angels right there. Ding, 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 ding. Let's continue. However, he would do this in a form of words pronounced so distinctly that there would be no more doubt as to the reality than if they came from the spirit of truth, i.e. the Holy Spirit, while those coming from the imagination leave us certain whether we heard the words or not. That's a, that's a good quote right there. That was John 4, right? The woman at the well, the spirit of truth. Yeah, she embeds her stuff there. Cool. Let's continue. But Satan could never counterfeit the effects I spoke of. He leaves neither peace nor light in the soul, only anxiety and confusion. In any case, he can do little or no harm to one who is humble and who, as I advise, does not act on what is heard. Paragraph 25. Results of True Locutions If the soul receives favor and caresses from our Lord, let it examine carefully whether it rates itself more highly in consequences Unless self-abasement increases, which God's expressions of love, they do not come from the Holy Spirit. Inevitably, when they are divine, the greater the favors, the less the soul esteems itself, and the more keenly it remembers its sins. They can be convicting at times. Hmm, interesting. It becomes more oblivious of self-interest. The will and memory grow more fervent in seeking solely God's honor with no thought of itself. It also becomes unceasingly careful not to deviate deliberately from the will of God and feels a keener conviction that instead of meriting such, favors it, deserves hell. In other words, it causes the soul to reflect on itself that I'm, I'm nothing without Jesus. That's what she's saying there. We're nothing without him. You know, I may elevate myself. I've heard a word, but she says when you hear a real conviction, it's like it just, you, you operate in humility now. You know, who am I to receive such a grace from the the God who gave his life for me? Paragraph 26, they should remove alarm. When these results follow, no graces or gifts received during prayer need alarm the soul, which should rather trust in the mercy of God, who is faithful and will not allow the devil to deceive it. But it is always well to be on one's guard. Paragraph 27, answer to an objection. Those our Lord does not lead by this path may suppose that the soul can avoid listening to these locutions and that if they are interior, it is least possible to distract the attention from them, so not as to hear them and thus escape danger. This cannot be done. I am not speaking of freaks of fancy which may be prevented by ceasing of certain things or by paying attention to its investments. This is not feasible when the communications come from the Holy Ghost. 
who, when he speaks, stops all of the thoughts and compels the mind to listen. He's convicting the Holy Spirit. Mark this, that I believe it will be easier for a person with very keen ears to avoid hearing a loud voice for he could occupy his thoughts and minds and other things. Not so here. The soul can do nothing, nor has it ears to stop, nor power to think of aught but what is said to it. For he who could stay the sun on its course at the prayer of Joshua, I believe, can so quiet the faculties in the interior of the spirit, so make it perceive that another and stronger Lord than governs itself this castle. It is thus effect of profound devotion and humility, seeing that it cannot but listen. May the divine majesty vouchsafe that, forgetting ourselves, our only aim may be to please him, as I said, amen. God grant I have succeeded in explaining what I wished, and that it may be sought guide to those who may experience such favors. So it's interesting though. So she covered a lot of material here. So what, what, what do you want to go back with now? Always check with God. Test the Spirit. Did I hear from you correctly? Go back and yes, you know, it may take some time. You may hear right away. Can you hear from God? These are the checkpoints, you know. Just ask him simple questions. That's what I started with, you know. I used to have a person that worked with this as like taking a tissue out of a box. Just like pretend like you're holding a tissue and pull a message to God. I'm going to ask you this. You know, it's not a magic eight ball. It's like, God, um... What do you think of Psalms 46.10? Be still and know God. Is it about praying? And just still yourself and don't let your, don't let your imagination answer the question. You may or may not get an answer. If you do, God, this is from you. I need to test the spirit. You start with very simple things and you work on. Like I said, if you're in a conversation that's going back and forth, like an argument. I remember when Jesus wanted to send me to the pagan fair to do ministry. And I was just like, you want me to do What? <laughs> I realized, oh my God, it was God. Because here we are having this debate in my head. Like, no, and like it wasn't Mike and uh, another identity of Mike having a debate. It was Mike and Jesus. And he was going, no, I need you to go there. You do some stuff for me. And so what's the other thing we know? That the if it's from God and he's talking to us, a lot of times it just drops in and will um, subtly intersect or, or drop in over what we're thinking. And like, wow, I wasn't thinking about that. Why am I thinking about this now? Because God's dropping in pictures where he's talking to us right now. And so it suddenly drops in. So again, my reference points here for you right now. If you're new to this, go get Mike Verkler's book, Four Keys to Hearing God, and look up his videos too. I know he's, he's he knows a lot of stuff. I have a hard time too. He sounds like me, that, that cartoon Peabody and Sherman. You know, hey, Mr. Peabody. He sounds like the, he sounds like the dog to me. Like, I don't know. It's like, quick, Sherman, back to the time machine. You know, it sounds like that, but. You know, I'm, I don't have the greatest voice either. I have the, I have the face for broadcasting, right? And I don't have the greatest voice either. But so it's, it's you know, go ahead and get past the voice because the guy knows his stuff. He knows his stuff on hearing God. And I highly recommend him. It's Mark Verkler, V-A-R-K-L-E-R. And I always leave, drop his um, stuff in my show notes on fieldguidespiritualwarefare.blogspot.com. Go look it up there. But that's kind of how we know we're hearing from God and discern, discern dreams. You know, that's another hard one, too, because everybody thinks they can discern dreams and they can't. Not everybody can. Not everybody in the Bible can. Some are people are trained. I was trained that my wife is just can discern dreams like crazy. I can partially discern dreams, and then I get mechanical and pull them apart. But, you know, go through training first. I highly recommend John Paul Jackson's course um, over any others to go do that. And that's the way to go and do it. Um, Cindy McGill, I know, somebody my power with conflict has some great stuff on dreams. But like I said, if you're either giving dreams or you're having... Um, I say, if you hear from God, go check in with somebody at your church, somebody that, that hears from God. You know, it's just, some churches will be difficult because may not be the pastor who has a gift of hearing from God. I'm sorry, it may not be. You may have somebody else in the church older, you know, farther along. Go talk with them. They'll work with you. Um, and just don't get stuck. I can't hear from God. That's not true. You do hear from God. Sometimes you just need some nurturing and some some spiritual direction to help you get over the, over the fence of where you're going and it starts working. Oh my gosh, that's that's his voice. It was on this channel. I was on the wrong channel. Yep, that's pretty much it. I'm not going to do a spiritual exercise today. It's because I want you guys to start digging into this stuff and start doing like, you know, have, sit down, have a conversation with God yourself. Learn how to do it. We've been practicing how to um, still your mind, Psalm 4610, and how to Practice his presence, and when you practice his presence, go in there and talk to him. Go talk to him. 
Cool stuff. So we finished up Six Mansions Chapter 3, Part 1 and Part 2. Next time, I believe we're going to the Six Mansions Chapter 4, Raptures. That's where the soul can get picked up in the spirit realm, or God, like he did to St. Teresa of Avila, he literally picked her up off the floor, whole body, whole body and all. And it's some, it's, we're getting some crazy, exciting stuff here. I like these chapters, and I don't know if it's going to be the next podcast. I don't know if it's going to be the big episode 74. will be Six Mansions Chapter 4, or if we'll go and pick up something else, maybe like more Exodus, or maybe something supernatural drop on my lap. Um, I'm actually going out somewhere this weekend to hang out with some cool people, some friends of mine. Um, actually, the people I did... Um, the podcast with and uh, the shift, right? Um, go out through this weekend, hang with those guys, and do some spiritual warfare stuff, and discuss it, and just hang out. Maybe something will transpire out of that. Some information, you know. We'll see, but we'll keep stuff rolling. I know it's been hard keeping the podcast going. A lot of stuff's going on. Middle of a renovation, remodel, and a couple of things going on right now, and it's been interesting. And some couple of spiritual cases I'm dealing with. So um, I'm not. Dogging on you guys has just been harder and harder to find time or you come back and you're tired like, oh man, I got to get my research done. <laughs> get the mind back and focus research. But with St. Teresa, it's easy to do it. So no problem. Anyhow, love you guys. You guys are amazing. And until next time, remember if um, you can find all the stuff on the field guide, spiritual warfare.blogspot.com. That's the blog site where we host this, this um, podcast, Tales of Glory. Um, again, we need financial assistance and doing research. I, I want to go places and pick stuff up and um, reach out and contact other ministers doing stuff here too and put them on. And like I said, stuff takes money and time. And um, But if you love this 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 content, you know, we want to go deeper with it, uh, you pay give us some a donation through PayPal and you bless us that way through m16ministries at gmail.com is, the, is how you sent through PayPal. m16ministries at gmail.com. Um, again, our books, we don't make a lot of money on books, but we're just getting the information out there, www.afg2sw.com. You can see it on the slides here if you're watching on Spotify or watching on YouTube or Rumble. So that's who we are. So God bless you guys. Until next time, checking out from the M16 bunker. Amen.